الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد إن شاء الله this session we're going to do a question and answer إن شاء الله session and next week we're going to talk about Ramadan إن شاء الله some affairs has to do with Ramadan إن شاء الله بإذن الله تفضل you can read the question إن شاء الله Uh, the question says, when a person that has small children accept Islam, do these children have to utter shahada or are they Muslims? Uh, if they, if someone accept Islam and they have children, those children are automatically uh, Muslims if they are young. But if they are uh, uh, older and uh, they were uh, upon Christianity or Judaism or any Hinduism or anything like that, then they have to take the Shahada. Does the woman need a mahram to travel for a medical reason for surgery or to visit a sick non Muslim relative? Uh, a woman must have a mahram because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لا تسافر المرأة إلا معادي محرم A woman is not allowed for her to travel except with a mahram except in dire situations where there is a situation of life and death if she does not have the surgery she may lose her life and she doesn't have any mahram. In that case, there is no uh, blame upon her if she travels without a mahram. But other than that, she must uh, be accompanied with a mahram. Naam. Naam. Jazakum Allah wa khairan. Wa iyaakum. In the time of marriage, she hid her illness. And later in marriage, after having children, she reveals the illness to her spouse. He remained with her. The woman asked for khula. Due to remorse that she felt regarding the uh, how she had her illness, so the husband granted her. So what else is upon her to do? As this sin she as this sin that she has as she gained, can she take her child? Can he take her children? So she had a sickness and she didn't tell him about it at the time of the contract, right? Naam. And then later on, she felt regretful. And she wanted to get out of the marriage because of that, right? She already got out of the marriage. She is already out of the marriage. So what's what's her question? So, uh, what else can she do to for for that since she had she had like for the sake of make tawbah, just seek forgiveness from Allah, and also uh, ask the, that man to forgive you. Uh, if he already forgave you, Alhamdulillah, there is nothing upon you. Now. Nah. No. And can the husband take the ch child or the children? Can he take them? Yes, can the husband take the children? Like a, a full custody? That's what you mean by that? Yes. Uh, no, he doesn't have the right to uh, no. uh, take full custody until she gets remarried. If she gets remarried, then he has, uh, he has the authority Islamically to take the children away from her. But if she is not married yet, and they're young, they need her, for example, uh, they're still uh, suckling from her, then uh, they should stay with her, and he can visit them whenever he wishes. He can visit them now. Well, yeah. The question I see, is there an authentic hadith for pain relief or body pain generally? Like a dua from authentic hadith for pain relief or body pain generally? <laughs> now, uh, the, there are some hadith about uh, the, the pain as a pain relievers, like uh, the, the, the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi uh, Wasallam when uh, someone hurts, like a, a place of your body hurts, then you could put your hand uh, on uh, that area that hurts. Uh, and uh, you say, "A'udu bi qudrati Allahi min min a'udu billahi wa qudratih min min shari ma ajidu wa uhadir." A'udu billahi wa qudratih min shari ma ajidu wa uhadir. Also, 
you a person can recite the Quran, can uh, perform ruqya on himself if he has a pain. Uh, recite al Fatiha, for example. Recite Ayat al Kursi, al Mu'awwidatan. And put your hand at the place where it hurts. All this, alhamdulillah, is good. Now. Now, Jazakumullah khayr. The question I say, my brother and I are studying the same school. And due to the political crisis happening in the country, we are told to go home, but my dad wants us to go home individually. Because he said we might both get attacked on our way home. So even if any of us gets attacked, it is going to be one of us. And as I can't travel alone without the mahram, because I'm a female, should I listen to my dad or just travel with my brother without letting him know? No, listen to your dad. Listen to your dad. Now. Now. If a person travels during Ramadan to another state or country, does he fast while he is not in his hometown, or is it just uh, the travel day? Like when he gets back to his hometown, does he continue fasting, or it is just during the travel that he won't fast? So he's traveling to another country? He already traveled, and he gets back to his hometown. So is that not uh, fasting during travel? Is it limited to while traveling, or when he gets back yeah. to his hometown, it continues? <coughs> the fasting? the fasting is limited only to the time the person is traveling as long as he's a traveler he can break his fast and make it up after ramadan he can also shorten and combine the salat as long as he is still a uh, traveler but once he comes back home then he's no longer a traveler then the ruling changes here he becomes stationary then when he becomes stationary then he has to fast now what are the rules for the parents to command the child with salah at the age of seven? Is it okay if the child doesn't want to observe salah at that time? Uh, they should encourage uh, their their child to start learning how to how to pray when they are seven years old, and they should take it uh, lightly with them. If uh, it's a little bit hard for them, they should go easy on them. And uh, also tell them the reward of fasting, the reward of performing the Salat. So the kids, they get accustomed to, to it. And also when they pray, they're thinking about the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them uh, for praying. Like for example, if they pray in the masjid, you tell them, look, if you pray with the congregation, you get seven ta- 27 times the reward. And uh, Allah will reward you on Yom Qiyamah. And you go to Jannah if you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, like this, little by little. Naam. Naam. Jazakumullah khairan. sister is divorced. She keeps in contact with the father of our children, letting the children visit them, visit by way of video calls voice calls to maintain ties of kinship so no. uh the court the courts are always allowing the children in view mother sits in a separate area covered and try to try her best to stay away from the view she doesn't enjoy doing this out of fear of allah and because the children cry and act due to distance from their father is the mother allowed to refrain from the contact uh, from contact this way Tayyip, uh, as long as there are kids with her her children are there and uh, uh, the video call uh, is made between the children and their father and uh, the ex-wife the the mother is in another area separate area she's in full hijab he does not see her there is no problem alhamdulillah because here there is no privacy so it is permissive in baraklafik now Naam, are we allowed to take help or seek help from non-Muslim relatives? And uh, is there an evidence from the Quran or Hadith to back this up? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sought aid from a non-Muslim guide. So it is permissible, ulama, bin Baz, Sheikh Razimin and others, they mention that it's permissible to seek aid from a non-Muslim. For example, you need money. 
and your mother, your father, or your siblings are not Muslims, and you ask them to give you some financial assistance, for example, because you need, or a loan, or something like that, there is nothing wrong with that. Now, now what is your advice for the student of knowledge who keeps getting doubt that he should not seek provision? Rather, he should only seek knowledge and is always pessimistic about seeking provision. Uh, a student of knowledge should not be like this because knowledge, it, not all of it is wajib upon you. What is wajib upon you is the basics, like learning about Tawheed and the opposite of Tawheed. Learning about the affairs of Aqeedah, these are wajib upon you. Learning about Salat and Zakat, basically the five pillars of Islam, six pillars of Iman. This is what's wajib upon you. طيب? And it doesn't necessarily mean that when you become a student of knowledge, you cannot be someone who earn a living. No. You can combine between both of them. That way you are not a burden on, on your uh, parents, going to them and asking them to give you money. This is not suitable for a student of knowledge. Student of knowledge should work with his, his uh, own hand. And so you can seek knowledge. At the same time, you can, you can have a job. So, for example, you work a part-time job, for example, and you seek knowledge. So that way you are combining between two good things. Now. Now, why, yeah. uh, in surrogacy, in surrogacy, we are the egg cell of the wife and the sperm cell of the husband is implanted in another woman's womb and the woman carries it and gives birth to the child. The question is, who is the mother of the child and also can the child inherit the father? The problem, uh, this issue, many of the ulama, they shy away from it. And Sheikh Al-Uthimi, rahimahullah, he does not allow it. Because the problem is, nowadays there is so much deception, so much confusion. Especially if the doctor is not a reliable doctor. Because sometimes the sperms, they can, be, they can get mixed up. And then we have a big mess. We have a big lineage mess. Then we don't know which one is which now. So it is better for the Muslims to distance themselves from this type of... Uh, uh, situations unless the doctor or doctors are known to be someone who fear Allah and there is no deception and you know for sure this is the sperm of the husband and it's going to go to the womb of his wife not, not another wife in that case or if he was if he has two uh, wives and they cannot bear children for example then in that case as long as we know that this this sperm comes from the husband and it's going to be deposited in the womb of his wife the first wife or second wife then it is permissible under these conditions now now should a woman leave her home alone without a mahram in the West with the fitna apparent these days? Uh, even if it's not a traveling distance, because a woman uh, going, for example, to, to the mall, right? In the West, US or uh, Canada or uh, in uh, UK, for example, if there is a lot of fitna, she should not go by herself. She should not go by herself. But if the fitna is not there and there are enough sisters in that area and there are so many sisters that go shopping there and that area is predominantly Muslims, then there is no blame upon her. Like certain areas, like for, for example, if you go to Birmingham, Birmingham where Sheikh Abu Khadija is, for example, the area, alhamdulillah, is Salafis. Salafi community. So the, the sisters are safe there. Likewise, Germantown. That area, there are lots of Muslim, Muslim families live there. 
and there are so many Muslim shops around the area. So if she, if she goes to the Muslim shop, there is no problem, alhamdulillah. No. No. Is it permissible to dissect bodies in an anatomy lab? Uh, from what I know, it is not permissible to dissect a body, especially a Muslim body. Haram. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, breaking no. the bone. There is a popular e commerce website. Now, what is it? What is no. it? I repeat is the question. Now, there is a popular e commerce website that allows sellers bring their products and sell on their website. One of their policies is that they don't allow people to download content from their website without written permission. I'm usually in need of pictures and videos of some products on this e-commerce website, and I'm unable to connect to contact the website owners, but I seek the permission of the sellers of the product who have uploaded the contents on the website, and they permitted me to download their videos and pictures. My question is, must I contact the owners of the website for me to be able to use the content? Yes, you must. If uh, they don't allow, unless you seek permission from them, then you have to uh, get in contact with them and get permission before you do it. Now, now, please, can you make me understand what this uh, yes man means in this in this afag afag of Abdullah bin Mas'ud that said, "Be a scholar or a learner, but do not be a yes man." Somewhere in between, he said, "What is the meaning of yes man in this afag?" Meaning. Uh, means that do not follow every what what the people say like okay don't go with the flow let's let's put it this way don't go with the flow because the people are saying it's permissible you're gonna go with it without asking a scholar without verifying that information don't just go with the flow now now please there is an imam that leads the solar here and whenever he recites Surah Al-Fatiha, he recites Iyaka Na'budu as Iyaka Nabdu, like without pronouncing the Dumma on the, on the bar. So what no. has he fallen into? And has this not distorted the meaning of the ayah? If his attention has been called to this and he continues, what should we do with such individual? Uh, if this man has a problem with certain letters, for example, Al-Ain, he cannot say Al-Ain. So instead of saying Na'budu, he said Nabudu, right? No. Nabudu. So he has a problem with Makharij, certain Makharij. So in this case, you should get in contact with the administrators of that masjid, right? And you tell them, look, we pray behind this Imam, and this Imam, he has an issue when it comes to Al-Makharij. So please, can you find someone better than him to lead the Salat? Because especially the affair of the Salat is very serious, especially if he mess up when it comes to Al-Fatiha, because Al-Fatiha is a pillar of the Salat. And uh, if he messes up and he does not pronounce Lain, then the Salat is not valid. The Salat is not valid. So you, 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 you speak to them, and you ask them uh, to get somebody else to, to lead now. Now, is it possible to sell toys or items that contain fish of animate beings, whether human or animal or things created like that? Is it permissible? Uh, permissible to, uh, to have them or, or on uh, clothing? What, what do they mean? Selling toys, like children toys. Oh, selling toys. Okay. It is better to leave them alone. To leave them alone. Because there is a big group of scholars that do not allow that at all. Even for young children. Even for young children. So it is better to avoid it. And not to get into a business like that. And do something else. Now. Now, regarding a man being knowledgeable about the deen in order for him to be able to control his home, what if he is not so knowledgeable? Should he get married or wait till he is knowledgeable before getting married? Uh, what is upon him is to have knowledge about al 
to have knowledge about the basic things, as I mentioned, and to have knowledge about the rights of the of the wife and the right of the husband. This is very important. Before you get married, you need to know the rights. Okay, uh, you're going to get married, and if you don't know the rights that your wife has on you, then you may oppress her if you don't know. So it is better for you before you get married that you attend like a course in the masjid or one of the student of knowledge explains the rights, uh, the spouse's right, like uh, the Ustad uh, Rashid Barbi, I believe he has, uh, he has some lectures about this. So listen to it and know the rights of your wife before you get married to her. Now. Naam, is it permissible for a Salafi woman to wait for a man? Like the, the man is still doing some things and he's not uh, getting married yet. Can, just, can she wait for him till he finishes what he is doing? Uh, it all depends. Like, if this man is a good man, he has a good akhlaq, a good aqidah, he is upon the Salafi manhaj, and he's going to finish soon. He's, you're not going to be waiting for him for many, many years. No, it's just going to be a few years, and he's going to complete his studies, and he's going to get a job. Then, alhamdulillah, somebody like that, you should wait for, especially if the Salafis are few. So you wait for him until he completes his studies, and then you, you get married to him, inshallah. Now, Naam, can you tell us the distinctive features of a Salafi woman? Distinctive uh, um, characteristic of a Salafi woman. A Salafi woman is the one who has modesty, who covers in front of non-mahram man. She does not display her beauty in front of non-mahram man. She obeys her husband. She does not disobey him. She knows the right of her husband and the right of her children and the right of her home. And she doesn't backbite and slander and spread gossip. She busies himself, herself with knowledge, reciting the Quran. She busies himself, herself with dhikr. She fasts when she can. And she tries her best to please her Lord, to follow the Messenger of Allah, to follow the mothers of the believers. These are the characteristics of a Salafi uh, woman. How does a sister go about it when she's interested in a brother for marriage? How does she go about it, right? Yes. This is a very good question. This is not just for this sister, for all the sisters, and I keep advising them. Take your time and don't be hasty. And I advise you, sisters, again, please take your time and don't be hasty. Don't get emotionally driven. Okay, there are certain guidelines you must follow. One of them is you ask about this man's aqidah first. What is he upon? What type of aqidah is he upon? Is he upon the aqidah of the Salaf? Or is he upon the aqidah of Ash'ariyah or the Sufiyah or other than them? See, this is number one. Number two, his manhaj. What is he upon? Is he Salafi or is he just playing games? And we're in the garb of Salafi, but he's not Salafi. So that has to be cleared up. And number three, his akhlaq, his mannerism. Is he a man who has a good nature? Is he a man who respects women? Is he a man who respects his mom, his dad, his siblings? Does he have good akhlaq with his family? with the people in the neighborhood who know him. If he's working, what does his colleagues say about him? This is very important, sisters. The other thing, is he financially stable? Because some of them, they may have good akhlaq, good aqidah, but they're not financially stable. That is not good at all. Because you don't want to marry a man who is going to have financial problems. And then what's going to happen? He's going to send you to your to your uh, 
parents home and it's not good it's not good you know uh it's like you're not married to him so make sure the brother is financially stable it's very important that he has enough money to take care of you and take care of your children uh, he has a place whether it is a rental or something that he purchased so he is stable he's not a foolish man who squanders money this is very important you don't want to marry a foolish squanderer so these are some of the and also the other thing also ask do your homework but ask the people outside his inner circle because if you ask the people from his inner circle they're going to tell you what you want to hear but if you ask people outside his inner circle then you're going to hear the truth about him now i thought he's saying that if she's interested in the brother not the brother proposing this time like is she's the one interested in ah that like what is the correct way to go through that what, what is it i didn't I didn't hear it like uh what the sister is asking is that she is the one who is interested in the brother and not that the brother came to oh. propose to her or something now so the sister is the one interested in him now now hey, how does she go about that as i said first of all she needs to do her homework about him and if that if that is clear and he's a good man everything is good about him then the next step she send the wali her wali to talk to him that's it now now jazakumullah khair is it permissible well, yeah. to have any other party attached to nikah is it permissible to have any other party attached to nikah like having sisters night nrd and the likes all just to make you mean stipulations right no like having other parties attached to the nikah like for example now we're having nikah tomorrow today sisters gather together to have a party and the next uh the day before some other sisters gather together at a, at, a, at the bride's house to have another party they call it different name sisters night bridal shower enas night and the likes of that but uh, if it is something that is done uh culturally done for example in nigeria where you come from the muslims they do that the sisters they get together in india they do that as well so they get together and they have a hanna party for example let's call it hanna party uh before the sister gets married and goes to her husband's uh, house they do that for her right alhamdulillah there's nothing wrong with that there is nothing wrong with that now now how true is that a woman a man seeking for a lady's aunt would see her without wearing the jilbab before the marriage how true is that uh no it sh- she should have uh, the jilbab on not she should not take off her jilbab and wear what she would wear in front of her uh maharim this is not uh, this is not permissible she can as sheikh bin baz mentioned rahimahullah she should be wearing her abaya and everything she can expose her hair it's permissible she can expose her hair her face her hand is okay Uh, but not beyond that now now uh, the question i say is i made wudu in the masjid and i, I walked a few a, f- a few steps and my feet became dry so then i put on my socks and did the tahiyyat in the masjid am i permitted to do mashu even though there was a difference of maybe two or three minutes before me putting on the socks after the wudu now there is nothing wrong with that like for example you made wudu and by the time you put on your socks one of your feet uh, got dried there is no problem because you now you have not lost your wudu yet and you put on your socks while you are in a state of wudu so you can you can make masah when you lose wudu you can make masah inshallah now now uh, the question asks that is it permissible for me to observe nawafil while reading from my mushaf while you're reading from your mushaf yes absolutely because aisha radiyallahu anha 
she used to pray at Taraweeh behind an Imam who used to lead her in Salat. And he used to read from the Mus'haf, as the Sheikh bin Baz and other scholars have mentioned. And that's why from that Athar, the ulama, they have extracted that it is permissible to hold the Mus'haf in your hand if you are making Qiyam al-Layl, Nawafil, or the like. You can do that, but you cannot do that with al-fara'id, with al-fara'id, the five uh, daily prayers, al-fara'id. Now, wow. uh, a co-wife was telling an uh, her husband that he is not obligated to have a close relationship or become friend with the other wife. She only needs to respect her, and that's all. She doesn't need to be a friend with her, and uh, they are not. They are nothing together except their co-wives. Is this statement correct? And can you please advise the sister on this? Uh, the sister shouldn't have, shouldn't be strict like that. She should not be strict like that. Rather, she should have a good uh, friendship with her co-wife because one day you're going to need her and she's going to need you. For example, when it comes to a pregnancy, you may need her to support you uh, emotionally, physically, she she's with you when you deliver the baby. Uh, you cannot just cut her off like that and say, well, she's just my co-wife. I have nothing else to do with her except that she is my co-wife. No, 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 this is not correct. So I advise the sister to uh, make sure that you have a good relations with her. When you cook good food, you send it to her, right? When she cooks good food, she sends it to you. When she's in need of help, any help, you help her. Because it works both ways, barakalafik. And when you are together, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts baraka in, their, in your work. And also, you make the relationship with your husband much smoother, more successful when he's happy. And there is no conflict between the two wives. Because when there, are, when there is a conflict, right, then the husband will not be happy. He will be stressed out, you see. But when the, the two wives are together, they, they have a bond, they click together, and they help each other, then the husband will be pleased, will be very good. So, mashallah, look at these two wives of mine. They're very good sisters, mashallah, they help each other. And he will be very happy now. Now he said, uh, what can you say regarding an affair where a mini masjid was built in the house where the father lit the salah to prevent the male from going to masjid in the community? I repeat, I did not hear the, the first part of the question. What can you say regarding an affair where a mini masjid is built in the house whereas the father lit salah in that masjid and prevent the male of the family from going to masjid out, uh, like in the community so uh, he built a masjid inside his home yes the compound this is not permissible barakalafik unless he built the masjid and he hired an imam and they called the adan five times a day and there is a juma there then that's another story but i don't think this is the case here right now, but if it's not the case, then it is not permissible for him to do that because now he is preventing himself from khair. He is not going to the masjid to pray with the congregation to get 27 times to 25 times the reward, nor is he, uh, you know, letting his sons to go and get this khair. This is not permissible for him to do that. Now, now, is it permissible to have paintings on, on walls, bedroom ceilings with the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or paint surahs, like surahs of the Quran, have them on, on our walls and our bedrooms and our ceilings? Is this permissible or it is bid'ah? This is from al bid'ah because this, uh, we don't know any of the salaf that did this. Shaykh al-Utimir rahimahullah, he spoke against hanging, for example, uh, hanging the name of Allah and the name of, of, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
side by side or uh, hanging ayat from the Quran or a whole surah. This is not from the way of the Salaf. Or painting it on the wall or the like. This is not from the way of the Salaf al-Salih. Now, now, the sister said, I am a 26-year-old 26, 26 lady. My father has refused all four of my suitors in the past six years. He will tell me that marriage is not my priority and I have to serve him first. I tried to ask his friends and member of the family after the fourth rejection to speak with him, but he ends up telling false tales of how I have been, it, I have been a disobedient child and I belong to a tabligi sect. Even though I'm upon Sunnah, but he is referring to Sunnah as a tabligi sect. He insists that I have to take off my jilbab and kneel down for him before he lets me get married. And the friends and family members are of the opinion that I should obey him. I had gone to the Sharia courts in my town for the change of Wilaya nine months ago. However, they are not upon Sunnah there and, and initially taking side with him after he was invited. Eventually, when they saw the truth, but the Wilaya is still here to be changed. As the Grand Cordy keeps saying that he is trying to make moves to prevent my father from causing troubles in the future. I have been told, I have told the Sharia court that I won't change the will, the will won't be changed. And the, the, uh, they will just keep delaying the matter as they haven't done any of such in the past. Please, what do you advise I do? That the Sharia court won't, uh, won't do the change of will They'll just keep postponing it, postponing it. So what should I do? If uh, there is, uh, if you have a brother, there your brother can be your wali. Your brother can be your wali. If your bro if you have a brother, he should be the wali. Barakalafik. You can you talk to him, and you tell him, look, my father, he's been oppressing me, and you've seen it for six years. Whenever a suitor comes, he rejects him for no reason. So. I need to get married, and I'm a woman. I have desires like everyone else. I need to get married. I fear for myself. So, her brother can be her wali, inshallah. Now. Now, a sister has missed Salah for seven days since she was on a study trip. What should she do now? Should she make Qadr? If yes, should it be in two units or the actual units of the Salawat? Repeat the question again. Sorry. A sister has missed Salah for seven days. Like she seven was on days. a study trip. So for seven days, she couldn't observe Salah because she was on a study trip. She so was where? What should where she, she, she do now? Should she make a where? study trip? Maybe probably she traveled with the university or something. Oh, for seven days. For seven days, yes. But she shouldn't have. Uh miss the salawat because even if you're traveling you can combine the salat you can combine duhar and asr maghrib and isha so she feels that should she make the qada and should they be in two units or they should be in actual units of each salawat like should they be in two two units or she should make it as they are normally uh, either way is fine like for example uh because if it's seven days it is better to make al-qada it's better to make al-qada now and also along with that she she needs to seek forgiveness from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now how can one completely stay away from agriya showing off what are your uh, thoughts how, of yeah now how can we completely stay away from agriya like showing off. When someone knows the evil effect of Riyah, that it destroyed that particular deed, then for sure this person is going to be scared to commit any Riyah. Because when a person is doing Riyah, he's not doing that particular good deed for the sake of Allah. He's doing it. He's doing it for the sake of the people, and this is what the, we call minor shirk. It's not major shirk. It's minor shirk, but it is very dangerous. It's from the major sins. So when a person knows that this can lead to to major kufr, a major shirk, then a person will be scared enough to stay away from riyah, and also ikhlas. A person 
should work on his ikhlas that when you do things you do it for the sake of Allah you don't do it because the people are watching you or because you're you want fame or you want the people to praise you or the like now now the question I says the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that says that if an evil thought comes to a believer he won't be punished if he doesn't act, act upon it does that hadith apply to Riyah? Repeat the repeat again. The question I say is that uh, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he mentioned that if an evil thought comes to a believer, he won't be punished for that thought if he if he doesn't act upon that thought. Does that hadith applies to riya to showing off? Naam, it also applies to riya because uh, if an evil thought comes to you from the whispers of a shaitan right for example he whispers to you to embellish your prayer right and you did not act upon it then there is no sin upon you and no blame upon you right but if you acted upon it and you embellished your prayer for the sake of someone who's watching you then you have fallen into sin because this is what Ria is all about when you do things for the sake of the people now no, uh, the couples have marital rights to one another, even if the mahal has be, hasn't been paid yet. Like the husband haven't paid the mahal, they have marital rights over each other. If he has not paid al mahar, and the mahar is deferred, there is no problem. Alhamdulillah, the marriage contract is valid. So what is upon each other is to fulfill the contract and the condition that they have agreed upon. So. If he agreed to give her al-mahr within one month, for example, then he should give her al-mahr. And also, it is upon them to uh, have a walima when they when they when they get married. And also, he needs to provide a place for her. He needs to make sure that she has enough clothing, she has food, she has everything she needs, all her maintenance. And at the same time, the woman uh, obeys her husband. Now, now, what is ruling on takaful Islamic insurance? Islamic insurance, like you're talking about auto insurance or health insurance? The question I mentioned insurance generally, like you said, takaful insurance Islamic in insurance. general is haram. In general, insurance is haram, especially life insurance. That is far worse. But if there is a dire necessity to have it, like for example, in a Western country, you have to have insurance, right? And if you don't have insurance, you may even go to jail if you don't have insurance. So in that case, you can have liability insurance, not the full coverage, liability. Likewise, health insurance. You have, sometimes you have to have it. You have no other choice because the expenses are too much. So, for example, when you work for a company, they pay 80% of your insurance cost and you pay 20%. This is far easier than if you were to pay 100% cash. It will be too much for you. Unless, unless the country where you live, the the health care is cheap, and you can afford it, then in that case you don't do it. You don't resort to insurance. Now, now I'm doing the last question, inshallah. Now, the question I say, my brother used to be involved in cryptocurrency. However, he told me he has stopped. Although I am not completely convinced. I'm not completely convinced, but it gives me gifts like money to repair my digital device. Am I sinful for receiving the gift? And is the device haram for me to use? He was involved in riba, you said? He was involved in cryptocurrency, all these Bitcoin and the likes. Okay, there is nothing upon you. Whatever he gives you is halal for you. There is nothing upon you. Barakallah. Now. 